So hi, welcome everyone to Your Story Well Told with Corey Rosen and his brother Steve. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Mechanics, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library. The oldest, in fact, designed to serve the general public in California. We are also a cultural event center and a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It is only $120 a year. And with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. Our topic today is the new book, Your Story Well Told, uh, by Corey Rosen. Um, he is an Emmy Award winning writer, actor, and storytelling teacher. And he brought along for the ride today uh, his brother Steve Rosen, who is a writer as well, an actor, and a composer and lyricist based out of New York City. Thank you so much, uh, Corey and Steve, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank for you. Having us. Thanks for having us. Yes, I got to say, so I am so excited to be here. Um, so excited, in fact, that I, I put on cologne, which <laughs> is, I, I have no idea why. I, I'm, I'm just talking on the computer, and uh, but I smell great. So I think, you smell, there, I think you smell great. And since you're Thank my brother, you. I probably smell similar to you. I think we have the same scent. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like Aqua Velva, our father's As favorite As a matter snack. of fact, I have a question about that, Steve. Do yeah. you use Tresemme um, shampoo? Yes, and um, I also still use finesse every now and again, <laughs> which is our childhood shampoo. Because yeah. just the other day, Noli, I don't know, my daughter who is thirteen years old, who's being bought mitzvah next uh, Saturday, she uh, changed her shampoo, and she came up to me and she was like, "Smell my hair," and I'm like, <laughs> "Okay," and then she's like, "Tell me I don't smell like Uncle Stevie," and one hundred percent, she smelled like Uncle Stevie, and then I, I I put it all together. So there you go, busted. Busted. Well, I, I'm I, I am I'm thrilled that she that her memories of me are mostly smell related. Um, every uncle's dream is I just want my niece to be able to identify me with her nose. Yeah. Um, yep. Well, hi, hi, Corey. Let's 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 talk for a second. Enough about me and my fabulous hair. What I have left. Mm -hmm. Let's talk for a second about you. Um, Do you want some hair? Because I can. I'm going to cut this all off for the bat mitzvah. So. Are you really? Yeah. Well, I'm sure this is actually, this is groundbreaking news for our mother who is on this call. I'm sure she is very, very excited to find out about that. Yes. Um, but I love that you have kept the, the, the hairstyle from this entire pandemic. I love the fact that you actually have had like some sun in, it looks like there, that you actually, all the things our, our mom would never let us do. You've grown it out, yeah. you've dyed it a different color. Yeah. Um, now just get some earrings. Daughter, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take part credit, because she did it. She's like, we're, we're doing something with it, dad, yeah. It looks great, yeah. it looks Thank great. You. And are you, I mean, is it long enough to donate that much hair? I don't know, I've never had that much. I've heard no. I think you need okay. a foot, a, a, a solid foot of hair to donate is what I have heard, so unfortunately. All right. Well, good news for me. My shoulders and birds. My shoulders and back are eligible, so I will be go. donating all of that. Corey, you wrote a book. You wrote yeah. a book. My brother Corey Rosen wrote a book called "Your Story Well Told," um, mm -hmm. which is a uh, well. It says here creative strategies to develop and perform stories that wow an audience. Um, yes. But let me explain, uh, as someone who has read it, to everyone out there who may not have read this yeah. fabulous book yet. Um, it is not only a, a strategy guide that tells you the best ways to, uh, to engage an audience, to engage a group of people, to find a story. It also is chock full of uh, phenomenal and hilarious, um, well thought out stories uh, of my brothers from his life, uh, some from our childhood, some involving our families. And um, I think it's a, a very cool opportunity for you and I to talk a little, Corey, because you and I both write as you know, part of our job, um, but it's very rare that you and I ever get a chance to talk shop about this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd like to thank Taryn and the uh, Mechanics Institute for having us here today to give us this opportunity. 
Um, I apologize, uh, Taryn and the Mechanics Institute for bringing my Volkswagen to you. I, I, I did not understand what exactly Mechanics Institute meant, um, but thank you for trying to fix it. You know, <laughs> you, you had books to help me try and fix it. Yes. Um, but so Corey, um, congratulations on writing this book. It's, it's phenomenal. Uh, thank you so much. I am so, uh, I, I, I can't kind of can't believe that it's a thing. You know, um, it was a weird, a weird process for me in terms of like coming up with this idea for something, um, writing it down, you know, and um, learning from my my book agent, Randy Pizer at Author One Stop, who is like, you actually haven't written a book. She said you wrote a manuscript. I learned that that it's not a book until it comes out. And um, and once it once the fine people at Mango Publishing made it into a book, then it became um, a book. And the process it looks of, like a book. It looks like it looks a book. Like a book. It feels it like feels a book. Yeah, and then another bookish. weird. Yeah, and then another weird thing happened, which is that that when the book came came out a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, I told people about it, and um, people started to buy the book. And then the really weird thing happened, which is that people read the book. And I say that's a weird thing because you would think as an author that that would be like a foregone conclusion, but it's almost like somewhere in the process of making the thing, I forgot about that part. I was like. Oh yeah, people aren't just going to buy the thing, they're going to read it. And so I want to thank all the, those of you who are here who have already bought the book and maybe even read a few pages or for those of you who hadn't yet, because um, I, th I think it's good. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is too. Uh, and writing yeah. a book, interestingly enough, because I think a lot of the work that you do with storytelling, aside from being a master storyteller who hosts The Moth, uh, in the Bay Area every month, you also uh, teach storytelling as well, mm -hmm. which is a very, uh, you know, it's a very verbal, a very oral, a very on your feet kind of way of uh, getting a point across. Whereas mm -hmm. in this, you've actually had to write down all the thoughts and put them into, you know, a sequential order, speak a little less colloquially about what it is you're talking sure. about. How, how, yeah. how did you find that experience? Having never written a, a book before, how did you find that experience? Well, having taught for a, a long time, for having taught for a number of years, especially on the topic of storytelling, I feel that ta talk teaching is such a teacher to us. You know, it's almost like like the secret of of teaching something. Uh, a friend of mine once gave me this advice that if you want to really learn a subject, teach a class in it. Um, don't just take a class in it because by teaching a class, you have to become an expert in the subject and you really, really imbibe from the students and you learn from each other. You learn from the class. And so the book is kind of the culmination also of a lot of that, of a lot of classes that I have taught. And it's not just my own stories. It's stories that I have heard, stories that I've heard in shows like The Moth, stories that, that students of mine have told in classes. And a lot of our process, people's process of developing and telling better stories involves the telling and the retelling of those stories. You know, there's the version that comes out when somebody asks you something and you tell them the thing that happened. And then when you kind of craft that into a story that has those, um, you know, those sort of changes that happen in life, you know, something that encapsulates not just this thing that happened, but this experience of, of why am I telling you about this? Why is that thing happening? Was the thing that was fun to write down, of course, into a book of to take these, these lessons, these ideas, and then to structure them into kind of like a three part process, which is like finding creative ideas, which I know a lot of people hear through this, um, this particular session, that's sort of a topic of interest of like, where do these ideas come from? And that's really an interest to me is, is tapping into my, my own ideas and helping people find like, what are my stories? What are the, what are maybe the stories that I tell all the time that I, I could tell better or what are new stories that I haven't tapped into structuring those stories and ultimately um, telling them. So the book is the sort of the, the culmination of that is like taking these various like learnings, wisdoms and teachings that I've done and encapsulating them in there. Yeah. That's so cool. I, 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 and, and, yeah. and, and, and so on the subject, I mean, you cover so many interesting subjects in here. Again, I'm not, I'm, we're not here to sell the book today. We're going to have a conversation really about writing. I mean, if you want to mm -hmm. buy the book, it is on sale. You can absolutely buy it. 
wherever books are sold. I encourage you to find a wonderful um, small bookstore um, to buy such a book at. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about sort of just the creation of stories, creativity and productivity mm -hmm. for writers. Um, mm -hmm and especially finding a story. And I was thinking maybe it might be fun mm -hmm. if you and I <laughs> were to, um, on the spot, tell uh -huh. a story uh, together, the way that we sort of would do on car trips when we were kids. Uh, yes, like throughout our entire lives. I don't know how this first started, but for people uh, that are watching, my brother and I, just communicate sometimes in like word at a time stories. We will just make stories up to pass the time. And so we've been doing this how long since? I mean, as, as, as long as, as I yeah. can remember. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I remember, I, I mean, it might've come after your first summer at French Woods. I'm not mm -hmm. exactly certain. Maybe you had played some improv games there and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but improvisation is a very important part of my process. So let's just get one started, shall we? Okay. All right, I'll okay. start. Okay. John went to a large party where all the other people named John went. It was generally a party uh, for John's. Unfortunately, John forgot his name tag. And everyone asked, what's your name? To which John replied, uh, John. The end. <laughs> All right, so that is a very silly story about being at a party uh, for John, <laughs> people named John. Yes. Now, uh, I, I realized that you were setting me up to, to talk about a, a, a friend of ours named John, which I mm -hmm. used to do back in the day, but yeah. I totally uh, misread it. But so what we basically did there mm -hmm. um, is you and I had to tell a story together, meaning we neither of us knew where it was going to go, um, yeah. but we just listened and then we responded. So leaving a very sort of open canvas, the opposite yeah. of sort of a lot of the things that uh, when people try to tell a story where they try to get every word perfectly, you know, some people try to tell a story that way. Other people like to totally improvise. Um, tell me about the function of improvisation in storytelling and in your technique of storytelling. I, I love that question. Thank you. Um, the, like the game that we just played is a, is a game, obviously, but it's also illustrative of a mindset that I think creative people um, sometimes labor to put themselves into or get themselves into, which is a, a creative exploratory mindset or a mind space where they could be open to uh, creating, but also like surprising themselves with their own ideas. So like in the exercise that we just played while sort of fun and, and silly in some ways and juvenile in others, it's a place where I only had control of half of the words in that story. You only had control in half of those. Some people would say because we're brothers, maybe we are of a similar mind. Yeah, anyway, similar mind. yeah but we, but, um, but being surprised and having to maybe think what the next word was going to be and then change that because the direction that you took it down changed where the story was going. And I had to, I had to, as you say, follow the follower is that no one is in control when you're doing that. And I think that the overall creative process can be like that, which is the idea of, of letting ourselves be changed by our own ideas and letting an inspiration or an idea or a thread just be like, I don't know why I'm thinking this or where it's going, but I'm gonna follow that thread and see where it goes. So improvisation is a very freeing way of doing that to take some of the preciousness off of creativity. Like when you sit down and you have the blank page in front of you and it's like, I have to write something good. And that pressure can be paralyzing enough to say, or I can clean my room and do anything other than write because the writing itself becomes the, the, the pain that I want to avoid. So I'm going to do something different. I'm going to go run three miles instead of doing the thing that I want to do 
So I find like a creative, like a sort of an improv focused mindset is more like, let's just get into the space of, I'm gonna make something and it, it can be okay. It can be fine. I'm not gonna try to make something good. Just like when we started to tell the John name tag story, neither of us set out to tell a good story, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I never do. I, I never set out to tell a good story. That's yeah. lesson number one of this book. Don't try to tell a good story. <laughs> well, the lesson number one is actually just tell a story. I think that there is a lesson in that, which is sure. just the, the creative act of starting. And that's why storytelling is a great way into that. Because I think if you tell someone, sit down and write a story, there's that similar preciousness. But if you say, hey, tell me a story about a party, then talking it out loud, inventing it, saying it, telling a specific story about a specific time, you are writing, you are creating, you are storytelling. And that's at least a starting point to then go into maybe the, the discussion about, is this something that I, that I wanna tell more about or learn more about? And as it relates to um, telling stories, mm -hmm. um, it, how do we, when you are sort of, when someone says, you know, tell me a story, you yeah. know, finding that material with which to tell a story, it, it feels yeah. so uh, daunting. Um, and yet I think it's always, it's helpful to look back on sort of our own history because you and I have a shared history of yeah. our uh, experience with being told stories. Because I think that um, we all relate to one another through our shared history, through the stories mm -hmm. that we tell. Um, and I think that you and I uh, both grew up in a household where stories were a major part of our life. Um, our, our parents both are excellent storytellers in very different ways. They have very different techniques mm -hmm. uh, of telling stories. And at least I know for me, the first stories that I know about myself are stories uh, of which I am, I have no awareness of. Right. They're stories that happen when I was really little, silly things you do when you're a kid. Mm -hmm. And that story that you did, that either is the reason you have a nickname you don't remember or something like those stories are, um, which, which they become part which of your story? identity. Are you thinking of a specific story right now? Like a, an origin story, like like the, the Shiva story? No. No, I wasn't thinking about a specific oh, story, okay. but do you, yeah. do you have a good one? Do you have a good one to share? Well, I mean, this is like your your literal origin story is that is that you were born because there was a slow day at the Shiva call. So mom and dad went upstairs and nine months later you were born. So like you were born out of uh, out of a, sort of a, a slow, a slow moment at, at the Shiva. Yes. Yeah. Or I, I mean, first of all, that is incredibly embarrassing and I can see um, <laughs> I can see our mom now talking to someone off camera, um, but it is it is it is that that story is true. Is that I I have heard yeah. that it was a slow day at the Shiva house, mm -hmm. and to relieve the grief of loss, yeah. uh, they gained a me. Um, but uh, I was thinking more specifically about the story when I, uh, you know, at the Thanksgiving that we spent in New York City, um, which wasn't a nickname story per se, but it's a story that was told my entire childhood that I had learned to tell over and over again, which in a very long story short, was at Thanksgiving at, at our Aunt B and Uncle Seymour's house in New York City, um, when in the middle of the night, I had just, I had recently become potty trained and I was excited to, you know, go to the restroom in the middle of the night. I saw a glass on the kitchen counter. Um, I was thirsty. There was another cup, but it was higher. So I grabbed the, the one I could reach. There was something in it. I, flushed it down the toilet, whatever was inside, had the water. The next morning, it became clear that I had flushed my Uncle Seymour's false teeth down the toilet in the middle of the night. And poor Uncle Seymour was forced to eat oatmeal for Thanksgiving. Um, yes. Now, that is a story that has been, I mean, that's the very short version of it, but that is a story that has been told over and over and over again in our lives. Um, yeah. And where I have very few memories of it specifically, I know enough of the story to be able to retell it. Yeah, I, um, I, I mean, I, I love that story for a variety of reasons, but one in the general storytelling sense, um, you know, families, this is where we probably do most of our stories. Like we remember our relatives, we remember each other, we remember things that happened and we construct our own lives through the stories that happen, these things that happen. Um, oh, that's such a funny story. Lori, you got to tell that story, right? And I'm not just talking to you, Lori, but I am using um, 
a Long Island accent. So that was, you know, you might think that I was talking about you. That could have just been any Lori that's in, in attendance here. But in, in general and in, and in specific, the stories that we tell about that, about Uncle Seymour's teeth, has become the stuff of legend and is part of like the way that that like we remember with love the people in our lives, you know, and and um, and kind of contextualize these moments that are all of the times that we spend together through these moments. So, yes, some of them are like that. This is a story that you are a major character in that story. And even though you have no recollection of that you have you know many of your own stories that you tell and the stories that i tell about my children uh in the book and otherwise are stories that they probably didn't even think that that was a story or something that was story worthy but when i look at a lot of my life now like as a as a parent for example a lot of the things that i am witnessing and experiencing as a dad are becoming stories to me because they're reminding me of a time in my own life they're like taking me back to experiences that they're going through and they remind me of experiences that I had. And that's really powerful, I think, as a storyteller too, is to find connections in our lives. So it's not just like this thing that happened this one time, but this thing in the context of my experience, of my life, of my work, of my job, of my relationships, whatever, um, whatever that may be, so that every story doesn't have to be every story that a moment can in some way illustrate what a funny little child Steve Rosen was who would flush his uncle's <laughs> teeth down the toilet because he was just thirsty. And in some ways that became a story about you, about isn't that funny? Steve always does funny things. Or isn't that funny about Uncle Seymour? Things like that always happen to Uncle Seymour. Like it became a story not just about the moment, but about the people in the moment, I think. Right. Yeah, his and, and his his grace and generosity to the fact that a child did this, he obviously was very pissed off, um, but not at me. I never knew. I never knew. Um, yeah. Yeah. So in that regard, yeah, I, I want to just sort of use that to, to circle back to your book just for a second where you're saying, yes, you have um, some of the best examples of stories that um, you tell in the book uh, and that I've heard you tell uh, do involve uh, experiences from your childhood and uh, raising your children with that same perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder um, when you are uh, trying to brainstorm ideas of things to tell, like let's say at the moth, because mm -hmm. I'm always astounded that every, you know, every couple of weeks you get yourself up on stage in front of thousands of people mm -hmm. and you essentially are telling a story that you, you may have workshop with one or two people. You may have told the story a couple of times first, uh, but you are exposing yourself on that grand stage. Mm -hmm. And so would you just mind explaining a little bit for those of us to whom that seems insane, um, <laughs> what it's like to develop um, a story for the moth? Great, great question. Um, first of all, I think that something that's very helpful for writers of all kinds is to like like focus the lens or narrow the funnel to some degree um it's sort of like asking someone like tell me a joke and you and like like i don't know any jokes and then you tell them a joke and they know the punchline like we know a lot of these things but we just don't think of them stories are, are in a similar way so having something like a prompt or a theme or what the show is about becomes a really helpful tool for any kind of a writer to say like i'm going to write about um, you know, uh, uh, medical stories. I'm going to write about um, uh, 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 vacation stories or, um, you know, or something specific, Canadian stories, you know, like whatever it is, starting to, to focus the lens helps us to narrow and go like, oh, I've got a story about that. Um, one game that I like to play sometimes is this game called First, Last, Best, Worst where to find like, what am I going to say about that? I take the word and then I append to it one of those four words. So say it was like Canada, like first Canada story, last Canada story, best, worst. Like, so it might be the first time I went to Canada. Um, I remember, I remember, I'm just, I didn't plan this, but I remember getting lost at the World's Fair and I think it was Montreal. Mom, are you there? Yeah, yeah I mean, and she I remember getting talk. lost because this was the 80s and there was the Pepsi challenge was a thing. 
and I'd seen it on television and there at the World's Fair, they were having the Pepsi challenge. And I just veered off as a very young child to take the Pepsi challenge. And I remember so distinctly like wanting to get it right and to pick the Pepsi. And when I did, I turned around and everybody was gone. <laughs> right. But like, I might use that as the basis of a story about my life and just take a moment, take the anecdote, take the thing and be like, what can I do with that? And and then develop that. So just finding a way in to a thing might then allow me sort of like to water that plant and see where it goes. I think that is brilliant. So the idea of the first, so you get a word, right? Someone yeah, gives yeah. you a word for the moth, right? So let's yeah. say it's, you know, uh, like in Canada. And then you think of um, first, it's either first, last, best, best or worst. worst. Yeah. Which yeah. I think is such a great way into a story because it is, yeah. it's like the, um, you know, like at, at, at Passover, for yeah. the Jews out there who've been through that, you know, why is this night different than any other night? Why yeah. is this story, as you were saying earlier, why is this worth telling? Yeah. What is it about this story? And if something is the first time you've experienced it, the last time you experienced yeah. it, the best or the worst, yeah, it already gives it importance. I've always felt like mm -hmm. um, most people are always in search of that first something. That it yeah. always is worthy of a story. If it's your first kiss, your first mm -hmm, date, mm -hmm. you know, your first, you know, traffic accident. Like there is something about that story because we all can relate to being ignorant of something and then being informed of it mm -hmm, and how that mm -hmm. changes us. Yeah. And I think that we as uh, audience members as well can also relate. It makes us think about, oh, when was my first time you know, um, you know, kissing someone, you know, behind the White House studios in French uh -huh. woods. Yeah. Um, but it's it, it invokes these memories. And then those memories and thoughts lead to other ideas, which yeah. then can then get you to your story. Yeah. But now you don't just get right up on stage and tell the story. Right. You no. you 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 what's the process like for you? So for me, it, I, I am not a, I don't go right to the page first. I don't sit down and write it first. For me, I think it's, 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 uh, I, I want to say it's out of some kind of laziness, but it's also maybe by doing a lot of, of improvisation, I would rather tell the story first. So I might call you or I might uh, talk to Jenny, my wife. I might say like, I want to tell you this story and see what comes out. And I'm doing it in a, in a conscious way though. I'm thinking about it, especially in this context, I'm thinking about, I might be telling the story. So in my head, I might be thinking about some basic story structures, you know, and the most basic of story structures being that like life was like this, something changed and then life was like this at the end. Like there was just some basic, you know, uh, you know uh, at least two acts of like something changed and then there was a, 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 a different ending than there was at the beginning, a basic structure. So many times when people tell an anecdote, there is no actual change. But for me, the process, I'm thinking that fundamentally, but I'm also just telling you, this is what I remember happening. And just like in the John story that we improvised a second ago, <laughs> there's this concept of like, okay, well, we created a world where a guy named John goes to a party. And then the thing that happens is that he doesn't have a name tag. There is a problem that emerged in that story right there. And so now there's some kind of curiosity, what's going to happen. So if I was to take the Pepsi challenge story, uh, there's the thing that happened and then the ultimately getting discovered and finding out something. And actually in, in that case, I, I learned a lesson, which was not about Pepsi, but it was about, you know, like, like being aware of your surroundings and, and being, you know, and, and also the lesson that my parents taught me of don't move. Like when you get lost, don't try to find us, we'll find you, which is a lesson that because of that getting lost story, that is the lesson I have told my children. If they're a theme park or some crowded place and they get lost to stop moving. And it's literally because of that thing that happened. But I've died. We also live, we, we, but, we, but we live in a, a day and age where there are cell phones, where back then, yes. like the only chance you had was to go to the, you know, to the cottage cheese booth yeah. and call collect. Yeah. and leave a message. Um, but uh, no, but so, I, I, I do want to answer your question, though. Can I just quickly answer the question, which is that I'm if, sorry, you've run out of time. Next. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please. So so I will tell I will tell my story to a person, usually a person that I, I I respect their thoughts and their opinions about the story. And then I listen. 
I listen to what they have to say back to me. So like if they have questions, the questions are very helpful. I think their questions aren't criticism of that I did a bad job in the story. They're things that I left out. There are things that they were curious about, things that they wanted to know more about and might help me. Thank you, Ellen Evans. Thank you. I'm, is there, eventually I want to see all boxes just like I'm just kidding. Um, uh, that. That the questions, the response of telling your story to someone is real time feedback where they smiled, where they laughed, where they looked at their watch or their phone, where they got confused helps me as a creator of the, the story to know in real time, not in a feeling like, like, oh, I failed, I suck, but it's like, oh, interesting that you, you stopped listening at that point. Because that's also a very human thing. You know, as people, if I'm telling you a story very often, the person that you're telling that story to is listening to your story and they're thinking of what they're going to say next. Maybe that reminds them of something. So their brain goes to another thought. So as storytellers, we're competing against, you know, people's own own minds and their attention. And we're trying to captivate them and draw them in and tell them a story. But they're also thinking about, did I turn the stove off? And what do I have to do tomorrow? I've got a busy night to, you know, so there's those sorts of things. And I feel like pulling all of those sort of balloon strands together helps me as a storyteller to craft it into like, what's the simplest version of the story? So I'm not overloading somebody's attention with details or, or narrative. And I'm just telling the story in, in the best way of telling this specific story. That's amazing and so interesting too. Yeah, I think that that, um, you know, because you are, you know, as I, I write a lot of stuff as well, you're my first reader. Like you are, it's so valuable to have uh, an opportunity to have someone who knows your work, who can, whose input you trust, who can mm -hmm. uh, read or be told the story and then reflect upon it in a constructive and helpful way. Mm -hmm. uh, and es especially asking the kind of questions that you were just asking. It's like, what, what part of that story, what didn't I answer that you wanted me to? Mm -hmm. Or what part of the story felt unnecessary? Was there parts that was just color, you yeah. know, that wasn't helping move the story or the plot of my story along, but mm -hmm. might be a red herring or just giving you some information, how much yeah. is too much? And I well, think one of the things- done, What you've done for me too at times is that you've caught on to things that I thought the story was about this. And then you're asking me questions about something else and it becomes like, maybe that's what the story is about. You know, I think when we're creating or crafting our own stories, sometimes we know the things that happen, but that's not necessarily what the story is about. So I think the story is actually about something else. You know, the story is about being lost or, or finding yourself or, or learning to survive in a, in, a, in a crowd as a child or something like that, some sort of survival, you know, uh, story. And the questions that like you've asked me or the or you've caught on sometimes to like a line i really like that line that you said and i don't even plan to say that line i hadn't even thought of that but it was like a tossed off comment that to you was the funniest or most interesting part so those, sure. those are really helpful in in the in the telling of a story too is to find like where where might a laugh or a reaction or a emotion come from yeah, because I think writing is a very solitary uh, craft a lot of the time. And so we mm -hmm. have the idea in our head of what it is that we're, what this story is about and how people are going to react to it. But until you're actually in front of people telling the story or writing it down, you don't actually know for sure because what lives in here doesn't always translate out here or here in a way, yeah. in the way in which we think it is. And yeah. sometimes we have, you know, we think, yeah, like you're saying, we think our story is about one thing, but actually it's really a story about growing up. It's a story yeah. about maturity. It's a story about, you yeah. know, um, best intentions or whatever. And I think yeah. too, that you, one thing that you do especially well, and especially well in this book is giving people the, uh, you know, it's sort of like a stand-up comic works, right? It's giving yourself permission to not be great at something, you know, yeah. to not feel that pressure, especially in the creative process to, you know, to give yourself permission just to sort of vomit out for lack of a better word, all of the ideas at once to sort of see, okay, I have this idea soup of all of these different thoughts yeah, and ideas yeah. so that, 
you have more stuff there than you need and you can start doing the real fun work, which is the stripping away to, as you're saying, get to the simplest, most yeah. efficient way of telling the story to get the result you're looking for. Yeah. Um, yep. And finding a way to do it where it doesn't last 45 minutes too is also a problem that a lot of people have. I think a mm -hmm. lot of people have issues finding the story within all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips, tricks, that sort of thing? Let's say there is an event and you're not like a, a skilled storyteller. Your instinct yeah. is to tell the whole story in sequence. What instinct do you have to help that person streamline their story in a way so that people don't fall asleep while they're telling it? Great question. Um, the one technique that I've kind of uh, discovered or developed over time, let me just mute dad, um, is uh, I call it starting from the end. Like, like if I am planning to tell a story and I know where I, I think that it's going, I know what the end, let, let's take this. If we're talking about true life stories, like our lives, sometimes it's really hard with a true story to find a spine of that story because it's like the, it didn't end like that. The spine. End Will you just ex explain what the spine means just very quickly. So the spine of a story is the is the is the is the sequential plot of what happens in the story. So the spine that I use the most is the Ken Adams story spine, which is an eight line kind of summation of what every story uh, should have. And they don't have to be Every story doesn't have to be told in this way, but every story I believe should have these components, which is a once upon a time, which is basically a setting. Where is this story taking place? When is it? Who is this story about? I'm not saying you have to say the words once upon a time, which are kind of indicative of a specific genre, like fairy tale or fantasy story, but like that is a beat in every story, which is knowing where it takes place. Just focusing on that for a second Sometimes somebody launches into a story and you're already confused. You're like, wait, what, how old were you? When did this happen? Was this in the seventies or was this yesterday? Like, we don't know, um, what, you know, like what the context is. So it helps the audience to funnel and to, to focus on what's happening. There's also an every day of the story. What's normal in the story until one day something changes. And then when we're to being told the story and we hear about what life is like until something's different, we as listeners perk up because now we realize like, oh, I'm being told a story. Like something happened that's different than from all other days. And where this ultimately takes us to is an ever since that day. Something at the end of our story is different than the every day. And so when I am constructing or, or listening to people tell like these big life stories, it's like, where are we ending? Are we ending on like a decision that I made about to uh, quit the job, to take the job, to leave the marriage, to save the marriage, whatever that is. And then I'll almost reverse engineer that. I'll be like, if it's about saving the, staying in the job, then maybe the every day is being unhappy in the job, right? Like, how can I start where, where I'm, I have somewhere to go with this and start with the frustrations? Every day I was frustrated and upset until one day I saw a job posting and the job posting was in my own company, right? And I, and then the, because of that, so then I thought like, I don't want to work for this company. I've been miserable for, for six years, but then I thought, well, but this other department could have opportunities of, you know, like, like the upshot of this might be that I ended up liking my own job better than I did because I had a different perspective. So knowing where you're going helps you plan where you've been. That's so interesting. You know, I've been recently I've been working, one of the things I'm working on is a, like a murder mystery. Mm -hmm. And so I did a little research into like, well, how do you write a murder mystery? <laughs> and um, and I read, so I looked at Agatha Christie, whose books I read mm -hmm. when I was a kid. And mm -hmm. I found out that she did exactly what you're talking about. She would reverse engineer her mm -hmm. mysteries. She would start at the end with the confession and then mm -hmm. work backwards. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is, very similar to the way that you're talking about like so how does the story end and then like and then work back to the good part of the story and then what setup do we need to get there um yeah i think that's very very creative um so when you're vomiting it out the first draft when you're telling that first pass mm -hmm. usually i don't know where i'm going with it i know the thing i know the anecdote and then sometimes when i then i get to the end then already in my head just because i do this a lot i go oh hold on I have a better version already that I start to kind of work on, which is to say, if I'm going to end here, I should start here. 
or mm -hmm. if I'm making up the story and I start somewhere then I kind of already know the vector at least that I'm going on. Like I'm starting from this place and I'm going to end up someplace else. Yeah. Yeah. And I noticed and then, too, it, yeah. when, when, when I'm, when you and I are workshopping stuff, when you call me in the car with an idea and you start telling me sort of thoughts and ideas, I am always fascinated by what, whether um, purposeful or not, what, what, repeats itself within your story, what thoughts or ideas repeat itself so that you then have these sort of tent poles that then relate to it. And I find that they often revolve around whatever it, the word is that you are trying to associate from uh, for that month's thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I just, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the way that you do it. And I've, I, if anyone has uh, never seen the moth or I, hopefully soon you're going to be able to get back up on stage again and we're going to yeah, be able to be in yeah. theaters to see this there's something so electric about watching people tell stories but specifically watching my brother Corey tell stories because um he also has such a not only is he a master storyteller but he also uh, understands an audience he understands um uh, the way that they want to uh, participate in someone telling a story the way we all do we yeah. want you know from when we're kids going to the library class in first grade we want to sit down and we want to get wrapped up in what this person has to tell yeah. us we want to see what about it we relate to and what about yeah. it makes us think and reflect on our own lives and, and worlds yeah um and i think and, and I, I think that that transcends that idea of like in involving your audience or your listener is a part of storytelling that I, th I think also transcends like the mo like not everybody wants to get on a stage and tell their stories, but of many of us are telling stories like at work or in presentations or um, at a wedding or somewhere where we sort of find ourselves in a situation where we have to tell that kind of a, a story. And that's also something that I feel like is a good thing to practice as a storyteller too, which is being just present and being aware of the listener and the person who's hearing your story because rather than falling into the way I always tell it all the time to the same, you know, to people, whoever the audience is and being able to sort of like surf the, the interest or, or their attention or their, or their reactions um, is very helpful. So even like at the moth, I'll, I'll, I'll go on stage with a story in mind and I'll tell the story and I'll find within the telling of the story, I'll be getting like a laugh or something. So for me, that gives me the confidence to slow down. And like, maybe I can tell more about that thing that I'm talking about here because I don't have to rush through that part because this part has awakened something. People are connected or listening or interested in what I'm talking about that's a really powerful place to be as a storyteller is the place where your audience likes what you're saying. And so rather than rushing to the next thing because you plan to get there, letting it breathe a little bit helps you as a storyteller tell it better. And as you tell some of the same stories over and over again, you find that the rehearsing of them allows you to uh, find the parts of the story that are important based on those experiences. And it's, it's so funny because I actually think back to our childhood and I remember in our kitchen that that phone that was on somehow they got the world's longest cord that you could take it all the way from the kitchen into the family room somehow like it went yeah. like 40 feet. I don't know where they found it. Um, but I just remember yeah. mom sitting in the dining room as I'm sure she still does now. And, you know, we would, she would tell us a story at dinner one night and then she would get on the phone and you would hear her telling the story again. Uh -huh. But you would notice she would hit certain parts of the story. It would yeah. get more streamlined. She would hit the important parts and you could tell how much she wanted to talk to the person on the phone based on how long it was. <laughs> so if she wanted to get off the phone, it's basically just like beginning, middle, and that happened. You know, but yeah, if it's someone yeah, she yeah. wanted to talk to, you luxuriate and you feel comfortable. As you say, you, you oh, feel yeah. comfortable taking the pause, taking yeah. the time to tell the story because the more patience you have in the commitment to where you're going, if the, if the audience feels secure that the storyteller knows the destination of this journey, it becomes more mm -hmm. of a pleasure to ride on that journey. Unlike yeah. riding a taxi in New York City, where a lot of the times he's like, so which way do I go again? You're like, actually, take a left. Like, sometimes the audience knows the story better than the teller, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs>
But I, I just, I really think it's so cool. And, and I think that it, as you said, it isn't just about getting up on stage to, uh, you know, to, to perform for thousands of people. It is, some people get really, really stressed out by mm -hmm. having to take the floor, you know, yeah. to have, yeah. to be at the center of, um, of attention and then have the spotlight on them. They feel the yeah. pressure to not only tell a good story, but also to perform. Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of the strategies that you use in your story well told are the kind of things that can, oh, Ellen's got it again, um, that you can use in uh, a toast at a wedding or a roast even at a wedding. Um, yeah. Something that you can use to write a speech or something, you know, mm. um, using elements of these stories. I just, I think it's, it's such a cool venture. And um, yeah. I feel very lucky that you wrote all of this stuff down because not only do you use all of your great ideas, but you also use ideas, Keith Johnstone and the story spine stuff and, and um, all these mm -hmm. different techniques. You are so well read in it that it really is a very yeah. accessible how-to uh, tell a storybook. And um, I feel so, uh, I'm so proud of you that you wrote a book, my brother. Um, but I'm also, as a storyteller, I'm secretly very pleased that if I'm ever like really stuck, I can just, uh, Go off I, camera. I hope, I hope you do. I hope you will. I have, I mean, one of the, here was a decision, like in writing, in writing the book, I, I wanted it to also be like a, an active aider, you know, not just the book about it, but like to have it be like exercises and activities and mm -hmm. like a workbook. And people have sent me like pictures that they've like filled in the lines, like written in the, written in the lines, you know, of like, I'm trying to find of, of, the, of the workbook you've created. Like yes. of the workbook, like, well, they've like filled it in. And that's so funny because I'm not that guy. Like I don't write in the book, right? I would be mm -hmm. like the photocopy it and or write it down on paper. But like never, there's people never who like write, write in their book. It. So like it's oh it's both ways. You can write in my book. That's all right. Yeah, or you can use a pencil. You can also uh, make photocopies of it anywhere copies are made. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like and, Mad Libs. Uh, I would write in the book. I write in the Mad Libs book. That is a book. Right, because yeah, you want to do it once. Yeah, and if you really want to do it again, you can just flip and do it on the top. That's a good. That's a good tip. So those of you who are here yeah. just for learning how to story tell, you're also getting some extra Mad Libs tips as well. <laughs> Should we take some Q&A? That's a great, that's a great question. Yeah. yeah. Taryn? Yes. Yeah. Yes, so there was a, it looks like the first question is from Russell. Russell, do you wanna turn your mic on and uh, ask your question directly? Uh, sure, hang on. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah, I know it's literally the worst question in all of uh, the pandemic. Is can you hear me? Is this thing on? Um, so as you can see, I'm at I'm in uh, Burbank and I'm at uh -huh. Prime Pizza. I'm just waiting for lunch. But I've been on this whole call from uh, I was in the studio when we started. And uh, my question, I know both of you guys, and it is so wonderful to see you in all your glory and uh, delivering this awesome uh, talk. I was curious because I do a lot of script writing now, you know, TV film kind of stuff out here. And so in storytelling, do you feel like, and this is maybe just a general question for everybody, but do you feel like the same tools uh, and games that you would play to develop a story for the moth or for improv would also apply to scenes in a TV show or a film if you're workshopping it, say, with another character you're writing with or another uh, writer you're writing with? Yes, thank you. That is a great question. I see you're taking it offline. I, go, no, you want to? You can stay on if you want. It's great. Can, to, it's great to see you, first Russell. Of all, great to see you, Russell. Russell and I were summer camp uh, bunk buddies for I want to say six years. I don't even know. But um, I'm so happy for your uh, your life and your success in music and in uh, film and television. And to answer the real question, uh, we'll each take a pepperoni. Thank you. I'll see what I can do. I'll talk to them. Pepperoni's really expensive right now, but I'll see what this I can do. Sponsored by Prime Pizza. But I I I believe a story is a story. I believe that whether you're writing a long form story for for uh, television, um, film, episodic. I believe that storytelling is storytelling and I, I feel like the principles all still apply in terms of like creative approaches to that. I uh, merge the two ideas. Like I feel like there is like developing a spine of the story is important and something that I've really worked into my kind of creative 
uh, process that's sort of taken from the improv world is the idea of um, using sort of the yes and concept in two powerful ways. One is to silence the critic that sits on my own shoulder that tells me that that's a stupid idea. And like we all have that that critic that sits there and tells us, no, not that, don't do that. And to silence them by just saying yes and just going with where it is and seeing where it goes and writing it out and then whoosh, looking and seeing what, what did I make here and what is working and then find the good and then build on what's good. So it's it's using sort of that training of getting past like Steve said earlier, getting past the idea of it having to be good the first time, because the sooner we can get into that mind space of it has to be OK before it can be good, before it can be great. Everything doesn't come out great, you know, and making more things or making more drafts and being OK with it, being OK, allows us to get to a better place. And I think the last part of your question to me was about collaboration working with partners, which I want to throw to Steve, because Steve, you do a lot of collaborative writing. And so how does that play into your uh, mindset as a writer that's collaborative? Do you use any of this, these ideas? Yes, or, yeah. I use it. I use a ton of it. And I, I, I'm sure that you've had this experience too, Russell, in that, you know, in, in any, like I work a lot in the theater and, and, you know, television and film stuff as well. But, you know, in, in the theater, you sometimes people tell a story through dance. Sometimes people tell a story through a song and there's different ways to tell a story. So the real difference I think is just the manner in which the idea is communicated. So, you know, if, if you are doing, if it's someone telling a story versus if Jerry Seinfeld is doing a standup act and then it translates itself into an episode of Seinfeld is instead of someone, you know, playing both sides of a scene on stage, you can actually dramatize it with two people there. Sometimes the most telling part of a story is what someone doesn't say, you know, and mm. that is also an interesting way to play. You can play with storytelling devices in whatever medium in which you're working. Um, but I feel as though when you're working with collaborators, um, there is a generosity of spirit that is always appreciated by, um, Letting letting the idea go all the way out. Let's let's just see it out because my instinct when I first started all this stuff is to edit every sentence along the way. To write a sentence, edit it to death, and then move on to the next sentence. And what wound up happening is I would get tired and frustrated and quit. Mm -hmm. So this way, if you and someone else are just getting all the ideas out, you then can sit, digest, look at what you have talk about it and find what did we both what did we both sort of key into and really uh, what felt to us to be the most important part of this story uh, that will help you both find the story and also find how compatible you are as writing partners because if you're both looking at the same thing and you're seeing very different stories it might just be your perspectives are different um, so either you find a way to find a happy medium as it were, or you find um, another way to tell this story or tell another story, you know? Um, great question, so, Russell, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, there also was a question from Kate Farrell. Oh yeah, hi Kate. So, hi, congratulations hi. again. You, so Kate. I, you know, during the pandemic and Steve, when you're talking about collaborative work. <laughs> Thank you. So sweet of you. Thank you. So uh, were you are you working live with real people face to face because this last year has been very, very difficult in terms of developing content for storytelling. And honestly, I, I wanted to ask Corey, um, do you find that workshopping uh the script is limiting how do you suggest doing it i know it was very difficult for me to work with um pairing my story say with african-american and we were so emotional and we were trying to match our stories through email mm. does that make sense yeah that is right. that is difficult this this week was the first week it, it, it so far that I've actually gotten to sit in a room with both of my writing partners and with the person with whom I co-compose, the first time we got to sing together in harmony. 
Um, because as you know, if you try to sing happy birthday on this thing, which we all have done <laughs> at one point or another, it's a disaster. Yeah. Um, so it, we are now finally back in the same room. And I have to tell you, it makes a world of difference, a world of difference. Um, but usually when we're writing, we have been writing on Zoom, sharing a screen, um, and one of us is just in captain's chair and the other person is essentially just sort of feeding in. That's the an that's my answer, Corey. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess, I mean, I agree with that. I don't, I don't do, um, I'm just trying to think which piece of it that I want to answer because there were several, um, components. Writing over email, I was going to say writing over right. email, that part of it seemed to me to be, it, it's difficult because like a text message, yeah. when you're reading something, we inform it with our own point of view. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. whereas you can, you can, someone can text you no problem. You know, if you're like, I'm going to be five minutes late and they're like, no problem. And you're like, no problem. How many times have I waited for you for 10 minutes? You know, yeah. whereas it's like, they're just saying like, yeah, no problem. Like we, because we put our own voice onto it. So I think yeah. nothing really does compare to having a conversation and hearing it in the voice of the writer, if that is a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say in terms of, of the, you know, I feel like as a storyteller too, you're, you're, you know, it's at least a verbal storyteller, your audience is a part of that equation and sort of pandemic storytelling over this format or trying to do a show, a showcase where you've got 10 storytellers and then you've got, you know, just like here, you've got 20, 40, 60 people who are watching silently muted and all you have is a bunch of names and boxes or maybe heads that are nodding and one or two laugh. Like it's just, it's, it's not the same. And there's a part of me that's had to just sort of suspend that part of myself um, as a performer and just be like, I'm imagining that I am hearing you respond. And I am sort of almost challenged in the telling of a story in this unusual format that we've like had to for the past year, but it's also been creatively challenging in that way of like, can I do it? Can I still generate ideas, find it in myself to keep making things even when I can't get in the format that I was used to doing? And at least for myself, the thing that has actually been um, good about it or inspiring about it is that I've connected with audiences that I haven't been able to. They don't have to be local to wherever I am. I could be meeting people and doing shows with with storytellers in Chicago, Germany, and you know, any anywhere on earth. You know, there are people here from from Florida and 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 other parts of, and Burbank, California. And my brother is in New York, and I'm in San Francisco. I mean, I you know, it's been a really hard year in so many ways, and I also try to look at some of the creative things that have been made possible because of it, including that. Thank you, Kate. All right, then there's a question from Alyssa. Mm -hmm. Hello, so fun to see you two Hi. together since I've been taking Corey's class and <laughs> now get to see, um, see you interact with your brother, it's been fun. Um, just wondering, so you said using the yes and to silence mm -hmm. the critic, which is that voice is strong <laughs> with me. Um, do you have any other tips to silence the critic and maybe tips to enhance the collaborator in our brain um, in addition to the yes and? Yeah, well, I mean, one one for me is is um, is is resisting the urge to write it down right away. Um, and if, even if you're not in a class or a workshop or something like that, I will sometimes just record it. I'll use like a voice record memo app or something. And even if I don't listen to it back, it feels like someone's listening to it. And I just know for myself that I'm more likely to get through it and to say the whole thing versus what C was saying, which is like stopping and editing every line. The other trick that I have is by not writing it first, by saying it before I write it, for me, um, as soon as I write it, it starts to feel like, oh, I worked so hard on that. It becomes more precious and I don't wanna change it but if I've just spoken it, if I've just told it to you and you give me feedback and I tell it to you again, it's still in that juicy, malleable, creative place where like it can change and it hasn't cost me anything other than the minute or five that it took me to tell it to you. So that for me has been really helpful as I see people that write something down and then I give them notes on it and they're like, I like it and I wrote it and I like the way it looks. You know, it's like, 
not everybody is um, like that, but um, Steve is sometimes. <laughs> totally. Yeah. That's how I am. You know me. Yeah. Uh, yes, and mm -hmm. um, I feel uh, very similarly. I mean, I, my, I, the, the idea that the, the only way really through it is through it. So sometimes if you need to be bad, as Corey says, the best place to do it is where you are your only audience. So speaking it into a voice memo and then taking a walk two hours later, listen to it back again, you can find, you get a little perspective on it because you're not just sort of in love with your own voice and story. You can have a little bit of perspective and that's always the hardest thing. And that's why I, that's why I like writing with other people because yeah. in my brain, it's so clear. And when I'm saying it, it sounds clear, but then when I'm listening back, I can hear um, this is not necessarily a satisfying story. I should put that part at the beginning or I should tease a little bit of that later so that'll pay off, you know? Um, it was also weird for me was like transcribing for the book, like the story about my cousin Norman, our cousin Norman. And actually what I, the challenge for me was I actually transcribed it the way that I said it. So I didn't get in there and fix it. The mm -hmm. way that then transcribing, like, did I really say that that many times? Like the, the, you know, uh, filler words and things that I, that I say as a storyteller, as a person, as a human came out in that. And it becomes kind of helpful also to look at your own stories written out the way you say them. So transcribing your own story from a verbal story versus writing it down, you may find, at least in my case, what I find is that it comes out feeling more like you telling it even in writing than uh, your writing voice. You know, writ written words, often writers, sound, it sounds very prosaic and poetic and beautiful. And if that is your style, great. But sometimes my style is is spoken, you know, it's it's like, should sound like me. And I think too, Corey, just basing off of what yeah. I know about your writing, you do write from a very yes and place. It's a very, you have a very positive spin on the way that you tell a story. And I think that that, is very good at keeping the energy ball in the air as you're telling mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. affirmative energy yeah. um and so it, it allows you to feed off of your own ideas in a positive forward moving way yeah um so i i really think that your use of improv is is um a great way into to finding your own story yeah yeah and to be also i think i said this earlier but you know, I, the book is not an improv handbook. Um, and I, my advice for people isn't like, you must be an improviser to be a good writer or a storyteller. I just think that the, the mindset is an interesting thing to study and something that we can all learn from, which is the idea of embracing to some degree um, the willingness to let our ideas go or to find new ideas and to say yes to them and to embrace them and to be creative uh, and generative, whether alone or with another collaborator co-creating things together. And uh, and I hope that the book is helpful for people that, that read it. And uh, I plan to do some more like tools and things on my website, which is just coreyrosen.com uh, that has like videos and things that you could also watch and, and uh, hopefully learn from as well. All right, one last question from Andrea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are you hey, hello, 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 hello. hello. Um, so first one, one thing to say, I'm now watching from the Netherlands, so if you are international at this moment. Hey! <laughs> yes, I love it, I love it. Um, that's one good thing about Corona, right? So we can meet across the world. So that, that's, that's what I'm saying. Totally. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, so my question was, um, do you have any tips for like a storyteller who doesn't really write? Because I do identify as a storyteller, but because of the language barrier and dyslexia, I don't write very well. So it's a issue. And I do want to, I, I take courses, I ordered the book. It takes 40 days to come here. So give me some minutes, but <laughs> um, I'm I'm wondering if you have any tips or if if it's discussed in the book, then I'll wait. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm I'm with you. I I I was a storyteller before I was a, really a story writer in this capacity. Um, so I totally agree with you. I'll t I I realize this is like putting people on the spot to leave their spotlight up. So I'm taking you off so you don't have to be. But um, but I I here's something that I find helpful when I'm crafting a story for like a storytelling show, and I don't want to write it down because of the things I said before. What I often though will write is I will write the beats of the story. 
so that I can at least remember sort of the sequence of how I told it so that when I recall it, it may come out slightly differently every time, but at least I remember where it's going, like kind of what the mm -hmm. spine of my own story is. It might just be bullet points. It might be a line or two. It might be some, some container that reminds me that kind of carries me from the beginning uh, to the end. Mm -hmm. That is, that is kind of a helpful thing for me. Steve, you anything you want to add to that? Or? Yeah, I, I think that's a great answer. I think the other thing too is um, using those voice memos, you know, like, and transcription software. Um, if, if writing is an issue for you, then we live in a day and age where you can speak it out and someone else can write it down for you, you know? Um, so I, I encourage you to keep, don't stop telling stories just because the, some of the ways in which other people write them down or, or track them don't work for you. You have to find your own voice and however you get that out. Um, and so, yeah, don't feel constricted by the only way to write is typing. Like you can write with your voice, you know? Um, and the more you listen to it back, the more you can figure out that structure in your head. Make make notes in whatever way makes sense for you. you know? um, awesome. Thank you so much. I gosh. keep working on it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and right. I, I'm, I'm so grateful to you, Taryn. Thank you so much. And everyone here, if you heard her say at the very beginning, you can become a friend of the Mechanics Institute. And it's not that expensive. And all this, you get all this cool stuff and opportunities. So if you can, she, I, I'm so sorry, I'm probably stepping on your toes. Taryn, tell them all the fabulous things that Mechanics Institute can do. We can do all sorts of things, but we can fix your car. <laughs> they cannot, yes, that is important to know. No, but uh, uh, yes, we have, we host all kinds of wonderful events. About a third of them are devoted to the craft uh, of writing because of you know, about a third of our members are writers. If you're a writer, check it out. We have all kinds of free activities. And when our library is open full time again, we have a wall of books on the craft of writing. Because believe me, the last thing a library wants is a bunch of bad writing in its collection. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to thank you both for um, your wonderful synergy and the book is is at, I just checked it it's on order um, mm -hmm. and it will be added to our collection. Hey. Um, so yeah, cheers to you both and thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you everyone who came out today. Um, it was great to see so many familiar faces and um, people who I don't know. Welcome and thank you. <laughs> All right. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, you too. You too. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.